Good morning, good morning, good morning to all. All right, we are Thursday, May 11th, 2023. And today we actually have a session on one of the most requested areas, which is clauses, clause drafting. Um, it's been asked from us for a long time and we had to find someone brave enough to actually tackle the subject. And fortunately, when we asked, the person who volunteered was none other than Brian Madigan. Those of you who know real estate know Brian. Uh, Brian, in addition to being a wealth of resource for all of us when we have questions, uh, is also uh, one of the principal educators um, who really goes the extra mile, not only to educate, but to continue to educate once um, once uh, you attend any of his classes or anything else, um, and uh, is a continual source of knowledge to our group. We're incredibly grateful for any of the time that he chooses to give us uh, for these types of sessions. And I would mention, because it's always better to hear it from me and not Brian, it's always looks better to have a third party say this, but I'm saying this genuinely, um, Brian offers courses and these courses are now being offered again. Um, there are very few things we promote on our channel, but Brian's courses are definitely one of them because we believe that they create so much value beyond what you were learn in Sheridan or the OREA or wherever it is you had your education. Strongly suggest that you attend them. You will see today why it is that we suggest those things as Brian kind of tap his courses. And Brian, maybe at the very end of this, you'd be so kind as to tell people how they can sign up for your next course session as well. I think none of us would mind that, particularly given that many people here have attended them and other people who have not would be well served to do so. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to stop talking and turn uh, this over to the person who is the order of the day, Brian Madigan, who will talk to us about clauses. Thank you all for your attendance. And last thing I'm gonna say, which I need to put as a caveat, our forum is private. These videos are public. As a result, anything that you say on these will be recorded and will be placed on private on um, public forums. So without further ado, Brian, over to you. Uh, good. Well, thank you. Uh, and hopefully everyone is uh, very happy with the leaf win last night. <laughs> and so you can set aside uh, Friday night as to uh, seeing an, another game. And the interesting thing with that is, uh, you know, that engages people in conversation. And uh, that's something that uh, right now people like to talk about, they like to talk about it today and for the next couple of days and uh, uh, hopefully uh, into June when uh, the Leafs win the Stanley Cup. But um, what's the interesting sort of part of that? Well, you know, one of the aspects uh, is um, in engaging in conversation with people about it, uh, you're talking about a couple of things. Number one, you're introducing yourself. You're talking uh, about yourself. You're talking about the Leafs. And all of a sudden, what are you, if we were to go back and analyze that, what are we really talking about? Well, you're talking in paragraphs. You're talking using clauses. You're making them up as you go. Well, of course you can do that. You've been doing that uh, since you were, uh, you know, one or two years of age. Of course, you've got lots of experience in doing that. So clauses is really not the actual issue. And what do people want to do? Well, they want to sign up for a clause course. Now, that's interesting because I have had them a few times. And I thought, well, they don't really work in terms of anything other than a workshop. But what do people want to do at a workshop? Actually, nothing. They want to walk away with a list of clauses that they can use in the future. They don't want to learn how to do it. So it's interesting because I have run a couple of those workshops and uh, people go silent um, in front of a large group. No one wants to step up to the plate and do it. And it's sort of like, well, that's interesting. Why, why is that? Well, to a certain extent, I guess they want it to be perfect. So let's go through and spend a few minutes analyzing how to sort of start and go through the process and what we would need and where we would want to put it uh, in an agreement of purchase and sale or other documentation that we would have. So you want to be careful and you want to say what you want to say. So let me share my screen here. Hopefully it uh, will work and we're good. Uh, now, what I have in front of me is a... Um, 
uh, writing clauses uh, PowerPoint. Um, hopefully everyone can see it. If We can see it, Brian. Perfect, excellent. So the first thing is, uh, what are we talking about when we're talking about drafting clauses? It's actually problem solving, problem solving, nothing else. It's not drafting. It's not getting one word first or second or third or moving a paragraph, different words around in a paragraph. No, it's actually problem solving. So you've got to start out and identify the problem. Now, if you can't identify the problem, you shouldn't be in the real estate business. That's your focus. That's your ability. That's where you're going to uh, uh, derive your benefit. If you can't figure out the problem, you do not have a solution eventually to that. You miss it. You've just put nothing in. You haven't resolved it. You haven't tackled the problem. So you've got to have the problem, think about it, and come up with a solution. That's the first step. And so uh, one of the things which I noted the uh, you know in the last little while, someone had uh, inquired about, you know, are there any problem? Are there any clauses that would help me uh, putting together uh, an offer to purchase uh, a business? And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. Number one, um, why would you ask that question? Some clauses. Well, of course there's clauses. There's, I have a thousand such clauses. Uh, dealing with uh, various businesses over a long period of time. Uh, what one are you looking for? Well, of course, the person wouldn't know what one they were looking for because they didn't know the question. They had not really been involved in the purchase of a business before. So the real problem then is not a, a, you know, writing the clause, but um, coming up and identifying the issues. Determine what the problems are. Provide solutions to the problems. Once you've got those solutions in hand, you have an idea of what you want to do. Now, just back up and consider uh, introductions. Introduce yourself. Um, and uh, if we were in a live meeting, uh, what I would be suggesting, introduce yourself to the person at the next table. Uh, somebody you don't know. Uh, now you've got about 45 seconds to do that. Int do that introduction. Now flip over to another table at the back of the room and introduce yourself a second time to another person. And what happened? Well, in both cases, you were correct. It, what You didn't use the exact same words, uh, but you were successful in terms of accomplishing exactly what you wanted to do. And what was that? That was the introduction. Why? Because you know who you are. You know who you are and you knew what you wanted to say. That's the real problem with clause drafting is people don't know what to say. And then it's sort of like, well, I have absolutely no, uh, no knowledge of how to put that in writing. Yeah, you don't know what you're thinking about. You're thinking about nothing. So um, in terms of an introduction, how well did you do? Well, you did very, very well because it's uh, very difficult to get it wrong when you know all the right answers. You know the answers, whatever they, they may happen to be. Now, let's switch over to, let's get into it a little bit further. Now we've got schedules. We've got Schedule A in an agreement of purchase and sale. And this is a great opportunity for you to demonstrate your competence uh, with respect to uh, a document uh, going forward. Now, we also have Schedule B. And here's an excellent opportunity for you to demonstrate your incompetence. Why? Because if you're with a brokerage that just puts one in or throws one out there or throws one on, on your listing, no matter what, it's sort of like, ah, what did they say there? Well, I don't know. I haven't looked up the brokerage's uh, uh, Schedule B for years. Yeah, well, they haven't looked at it for years either. Uh, because it's filled with, uh, you know, sometimes some rather foolish and goofy clauses. Yeah, clauses that have been replaced, clauses that were topical uh, 20 years ago. They had never removed them. It's sort of like, okay, that was good for a certain period of time. But it demonstrates the fact that, number one, you don't read your own documents. Number two, you're not paying attention to what's included in the Schedule B. and you know, what are you putting in there? Well, you know, what I'm going to suggest is if you want to put something in about uh, interest on uh, that, that's fine. 
Uh, if you want to put something in about defining business days, banking days, that's fine. Uh, it's a stretch to start putting in anything else. You're better just to leave it to, uh, to the buyer and on the buy side. And if you're coming along on the buy side, um, you don't have to accept somebody's Schedule B. In fact, they won't even notice if you uh, take their Schedule B, change some of the wording around, uh, and they wouldn't even likely read it. But they're getting it for the first time with your offer, so they should be reading it, but very often they don't. Now, <clears throat> with the Schedule B, who's going to make fun of you with that? Well, it's going to be in court and it's going to be when you've made some mistake somewhere uh, in the document or the deal and you're being sued for negligence and you want to say, I do everything perfectly. Well, let's have a look at this Schedule B and just see how perfect you happen to be. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, no, I, I, I didn't draft that. Wasn't this... You know, your signature, uh, you know, associated with this document. Yeah, yeah. Weren't you the listing? It? Yes, I was. Okay. Well, then it is your Schedule B. Um, so you're at risk with respect to that. Uh, so make sure that that works, not just ignore it and uh, move on. Now, what I'm suggesting is that most of the time you should seek some assistance if you don't know what you're doing. If you've never purchased a business, this isn't the time to ask for the wording, <clears throat> some random wording out there. You're likely to get it wrong and it won't make any sense. So you need assistance from your broker, your manager, uh, a lawyer uh, or a colleague. Uh, this is with respect to issue identification, uh, problem solving. And then finally, finally, third stage, writing up that clause. Uh, that is necessary to go with the situation. Um, just looking around for the clause is not helpful. Uh, that's the last stage. Practice makes perfect. The more you do, the better you get at it. Um, and the interesting thing is many people just borrow clauses. Let me cut and paste. So if you have one, send it over. I will take it. I will copy it. I will paste it in. And that's it. Uh, no, that's not a good approach to it. So if you really want to be involved in clause drafting, you should do it a few times. Now, I'm not a coach and uh, I don't do, uh, you know, motivational inspiration uh, programs for anybody. Either you're in the business and you want to do it or you, uh, you, you don't bother. If you don't bother, well, then I don't care. Just sit on the couch. Uh, you know, I mean... I'll tell you one thing, during the Leaf game, I didn't draft any clauses. That would not be what I would want to do at that particular point in time. But if you do want to engage in the uh, process of drafting some clauses, it would make some sense to do it, do it a few times, run it by uh, a couple of people, engage in some sort of uh, group um, uh, on a regular basis, a mentorship group. And, you know, like once a week, you get together for half an hour and say, yeah, last week I drafted a clause on this, this, and this. All right, that's good. I don't know whether I'll ever use it, but, I, you know, I did it. Or I did it all with respect to a particular property, but I didn't have a client. I didn't have a buyer, but it was a beautiful property. I went to see it and, uh, you know, a problem struck me and I decided to solve it. Perfect. That's the greatest way to learn uh, because it's not costing anybody any money. Now, when it comes to contracts and clauses, what do we have? Well, we've got four areas that we're really talking about. Um, a clause could be a condition, could be a warranty, could be a representation, or it could be a term in the contract. So in it goes. Uh, now, when it comes to conditions, these are deal breakers. There's two types. Um, a true condition precedent and regular conditions. Okay, when it comes to um, a true condition precedent, this is something which may not be waived uh, in any situation. Okay, this uh, is a definite deal breaker. When it comes to other conditions, yeah, if they were satisfied or you've decided to move on uh, and proceed, you're good to go. When it comes to a true condition, uh, this requires third-party involvement. For example, 
uh, the bank has to approve a mortgage uh, assumption. Well, there's no way that you can require uh, TD Bank to approve uh, the new buyer. They'll say, we'll decide whether we're going to approve that new buyer. Otherwise, our mortgage is due and payable and cannot be assumed by that person. Okay, well, you're going to have to uh, wait for their approval. Uh, secondly, um, you want to uh, sell half the property. Not all of the property. It's 100 feet wide, but you want to sell 50 feet of it. And so you need to have the uh, city or the municipality consent to create that lot. Uh, so at that point in time, when they consent to create that lot, uh, then you can uh, proceed with the deal. Otherwise, you can't say to the city, well, I don't care about you. We're, I'm deciding to buy 50 feet anyways, notwithstanding what you might say. No, it's not going to happen. Uh, now, you can't waive that third party uh, decision. And so that's very important. That's a true condition precedent. Now, regular conditions can be written as conditions precedent or conditions subsequent. Uh, when it comes to uh, a condition uh, precedent, um, it's written establishing uh, the issue, the, the timeline or the deadline, and the result. And that's you can deal with that in terms of uh, fulfillment or satisfaction or a waiver, okay? So what's a fulfillment? Well, that's notice of fulfillment, which is the terminology that uh, we would use. Um, years ago, uh, the concept was notice of satisfaction, um, but uh, it's notice of fulfillment, which has been the term that uh, ARIA has used. Or you can have a waiver. But in any case, as you go to move forward from that, you, we do need notification. Uh, something has to take place. When it comes to a condition subsequent, um, this is uh, written establishing uh, an issue, a timeline, a deadline, and a result. And it's self-fulfilling. All right. Uh, there is uh, fulfillment or satisfaction of it. Uh, that takes place. Uh, automatically. Uh, no, there's no provision for a waiver. No notification is required whatsoever if you're proceeding. You only need to notify in the case of you're not proceeding. So silence um, allows the transaction to go ahead. And uh, what I would say is, you know, you, you could use this for uh, a lawyer's uh, review, uh, that sort of thing, that that could be uh, uh, one where it would be uh, helpful in that regard. Now, if you're proceeding with a transaction and you have a true condition uh, uh, there, uh, fulfillment is, re is required. Notice the fulfillment uh, was drafted actually for this particular purpose because there was nothing else that existed there. And they thought, well, you know, waiver is not going to work. Um, but uh, a recent case, and this is years after the fact, uh, communication may not actually be required. So if we had a situation where the uh, city grants a severance, there's an actual third party fulfillment that would maybe take place at that time. But it would kind of depend on exactly what you said uh, in the agreement. Uh, and that's a recent case. And it basically would indicate that, uh, yeah, you've got to proceed. So what happens? When does the deal firm up? Well, it could very well be, depending on the wording in the agreement itself, the deal may have firmed up uh, Tuesday night when it went before the land division committee and the land division committee came back and said, uh, we've heard this application, it's approved. What time was that? 10.02 on Tuesday night. Oh, okay. Well, did the parties exchange any paperwork? No. Uh, were they both there? No. Were there representatives there? Yes, they were. You know, So you have any number of different issues and that could affect the agreement in terms of when did it actually move into that next uh, stage. So you want to be careful about that uh, because uh, uh, it may you may want to link it to the notice uh, that, it, that the deal is firming up because you have control over the deal. You may say, yeah, that decision was made by the land division committee, but I only got notice of it two days later or three days later, or it was the date they mailed, mailed it out. It was the date somebody received it. You want to specify that 
in terms of uh, uh, measuring items going forward. If you don't, it could very well be, yeah, that 1002 decision on Tuesday night uh, triggered your agreement. Um, so proceeding with the transaction with a condition uh, precedent, uh, the uh, notice of fulfillment will work. The waiver will also work. Uh, and uh, there's a choice. It's a buyer's decision. They can choose whatever they want. You can't say, well, you li listen, you went ahead and did this. So I need to have an, uh, a notice of fulfillment. No, I'm waiving it. Yeah, but you went ahead and did the home inspection. So I need to see that you've done the home inspection. No, I did the home inspection. And actually, I'm not happy with it. I think it indicates a whole series of problems. But nevertheless, I'm going ahead with it. So I'm waiving it. Oh, that's interesting. And are you allowed to waive it? Well, of course you are. And can you demand the another document? No, the notice of fulfillment was designed to go with a true condition precedent, not a regular condition precedent. So you can't uh, you can't do that. When it comes to conditions subsequent, you don't need any paperwork at all. It's automatically self-fulfilling. Uh, so um, paperwork and uh, you want to have uh, diligence uh, with respect to the dates. Um, condition subsequent, if you write these as uh, they're going to be self-fulfilling, and this could happen by accident. So you have time to arrange for financing, you have time to arrange for a home inspection, but all of a sudden your time is up and it's deemed to be fulfilled. Whoa, that happened. And uh, you know that could be that you were in a car accident and unconscious for a day or so and not mindful of what was going on. Um, so there's certainly one thing in terms of writing a condition subsequent, uh, that there's increased risk for real estate agents using that because the deal is going to flip forward and firm up uh, uh, without you doing anything. So uh, lawyers will use it. Why? Because they have staff. Uh, who are checking on these things and mindful of the uh, uh, of the uh, dates, uh, but otherwise we have a little bit uh, more risk. And so, if you're an independent practitioner as a real estate agent, um, maybe you shouldn't use this. On the other hand, you, maybe you don't want to be running around all the time. So, if you have a series of different conditions, um, it might be uh, good to put in the lawyer's review clause as a condition subsequent, uh, where you're able to send it over and then that eliminates, you say, okay, fine, we'll check with the lawyer. And you do that and you're alert to doing that. But then you don't, It the, when the time is up, it doesn't require uh, the functionality associated with uh, the transaction. You're good to go. When it comes to uh, warranties, this is another great. Statements concerning matters which are to be fulfilled, addressed, completed in the contract. This transaction will be completed and closed. All right. It's not that, oh, there's you've made a warranty about something. And if it isn't there, uh, I can refuse to go ahead with the transaction. No, you can't refuse to go ahead with the transaction. You have agreed, I am going to acquire this and I require a warranty. And if you can't give me the warranty, then you can give me an abatement in uh, the purchase price. That's your remedy, not walking away. Far too many people seem to think you can walk away uh, and if they put it down as a warranty. Representation, somewhat just in- Everybody posted is anybody far? Uh, just a touch uh, lower in terms of uh, what a representation may happen to be. Um, it's just one step lower than a warranty. Uh, you should upgrade representations uh, if you can. Uh, again, completion will uh, take place, uh, possibly with uh, an abatement. When it comes to the usual contractual wording in a commercial contract, we have the expression warrants and represents. Now, it's interesting, and I don't know why we it's split up. When it comes to real estate transactions, warrants, warranties are one thing, representations are something else. No, you can have something that's both. 
So why not choose the wording that's commonly used by lawyers in any number of commercial contracts? Um, and that would be uh, preferable to, to a degree. Uh, because what it would do is bump up uh, the value of any uh, representations. Slightly different remedies, uh, but uh, important nevertheless. Now, when it comes to terms, these are provisions of the contract uh, that are set forth in the agreement to be complied with by the parties. Uh, the result of the failure to complete should be specified if it's serious. Um, and so you should address that. So you've got to figure out uh, the issue and then uh, solve it as a problem. What are the components of a good clause? Well, the first thing is it's definite and it's clear and you know what they said. Uh, there's a low risk of misinterpretation. That's what you're looking for in a good clause. Now, um, what is it going to be? It's going to be accurate. It's going to be unambiguous. Uh, it's going to be precise. It's not going to include uh, irrelevant information. And in the circumstances, it should be as short as possible. But you know what? That's a little bit of a uh, red herring there because what do we really have? Do you know what? If you had a long clause, and it just happened to be long, um, it would, can, can still be right. Remember those two introductions that you uh, did earlier? Yeah, introduction number one, that took 45 seconds. Introduction number two was uh, three and a half minutes. Hmm. Were you wrong the second time around? Were you wrong the first time around? No, you got it correctly both times. Uh, it's just that one happened to be a little longer. Now, the advantage, shorten it up, I guess, save paper, save the trees, help the environment, all good things. Uh, but, you know, make sure that you've covered it appropriately. And you can do it because you do it every day with everything else anyways. Uh, it's very uh, unlikely that you'll get it wrong. That is writing it up. But you have to know what the problems are. If you don't know what the problems are in your deal, you're going to just miss it. That's uh, no, there's no question about that. Now, when it comes to what's in a good clause, use the correct verb. Uh, if there's an obligation, somebody has to do something, you want to use must, will, shall. If it's an option, then you say may. That makes it quite clear what it is. If it's a prohibition, and you, want, you don't want them to do something, you say must not, will not, may not, shall not. That's the expression uh, that you want to use going forward. Now, there's a couple of uh, good clauses which I'd like to have a look at. And these are uh, area standard clauses. Mortgage financing, there's a provision. Uh, it's drawn from uh, web forms. Now, just as we mentioned about web forms, the clause. The sellers uh, should be aware, and this is on web forms, the seller, seller should be aware that this condition does not contain any specific terms of the proposed financing buyers wish to arrange, and thus provides buyers with more latitude in declining financing. Uh, I would not say that that's an appropriate conclusion. Um, I think today, since the Bassin and Renew case, that if you put in, um, you know, that you're attempting to get 5% uh, financing and you didn't get 5% financing um, and you're off by just a touch, um, then you'd have greater latitude in walking away. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get. I put that in the contract. No um, uh, financial institution is loaning money to me at 5%. Oh, yeah, I could qualify at 7.5, but not 5 um, I would think that that would provide better than what uh, they're saying here. In any event, um, there's a further caution and it says buyers using this clause should be advised that they have an obligation to make a good faith effort to arrange the necessary financing. And this should not and should not use this clause inappropriately as a means to cancel the transaction. Absolutely. So there's no question about that. But I just want to draw your attention to the fact that you might if you want to step up the ability to walk away, use uh, an accurate number when it came to uh, the percentage. So when we pull it apart, uh, of course, this is what the uh, what it actually looks like. 
Uh, but there's an important aspect of uh, this. Let's break it down. And let's get into it line by line, word by word. Um, this offer is conditional upon the buyer arranging. And that says who? Uh, and you'll notice that I have this marked as a checklist. I have this marked as a checklist because I want to direct your attention to the fact that I think this is the perfect clause right here. And so if we used it going forward, no matter what, as a template, framework, checklist for another clause handling something else, not all of these will apply, but some of them would. And you might, what this would do is then catch uh, anything that you uh, had missed when you're drafting up uh, another clause for some other purpose. Um, at the buyer's own expense, that says who pays. Um, a new charge mortgage, that says what we're talking about. Uh, satisfactory to the buyer. There's the evaluation uh, process. Uh, in the buyer's sole and absolute discretion. That's the test. That's what we're going to hold. That's the standard, what we're going to hold them to. And then goes on, unless the buyer gives notice in writing, so we require an actual notice, that's going to be the trigger, uh, delivered to the seller personally, Okay, so we have personal services allowed uh, or in accordance with any other provisions for the delivery of notice in this agreement of purchase and sale uh, or any schedule there too. That's the delivery. So you might be able to send it to their, um, uh, you might be able to send it by email uh, if they provided for that in the notices section. You might be able to send it to their agent if it's provided in the notices uh, section. Uh, you might be able to send it to their lawyer if they identify their lawyer in the acknowledgement section. And the acknowledgement section doesn't need to be signed by them. In other words, they don't have to have their final copy yet, but they would already have to have uh, their uh, lawyer's uh, name in there and contact information, et cetera, for that delivery to take place. So that's the next step. Uh, not later than, that's the time period. Now, the reference to not later than is the perfect way of expressing uh, that time uh, period. People often will use different approaches to attack a time period. Don't. Be consistent. It's, it may be repetitive, uh, but using the same words over and over again adds clarity uh, that this condition is fulfilled. So that's the satisfaction of it. Uh, uh, this offer shall be null and void. That would be the re result. Uh, the, and the deposit uh, shall be delivered uh, or returned to the uh, buyer. That's the consequence. In full, without deduction. And uh, so you'd have a calculation that would be necessary there. But if you went through that, you'd say, you know what? That pops up almost every time. Uh, this condition is included for the benefit um, of the buyer. All right, and so we know uh, why that clause is in there and may be waived. So waiver is permitted. So it's not negotiable in terms of, oh, but I'm demanding uh, that a notice of uh, fulfillment uh, be provided to me. No, it says a waiver. You can go with the waiver. And there can be all kinds of reasons why a buyer just says, you know what, that's what I want to do. Uh, at the buyer's sole option, and that's the question of who's making the decision uh, by notice in writing to the seller, as aforesaid, that's the notice uh, within the time period stated herein. Again, that's the time period. So if you had all those things as a little checklist, have I covered these things off uh, in any kind of a uh, clause that you're drafting up, uh, that would be good because I would be inclined to say, you know what, pretty much this is the perfect uh, clause. Um, the mortgage clause as a condition subsequent is written a little bit differently. Uh, the buyer may terminate this agreement through written notice delivered to the seller personally or in accordance with any uh, other uh, provisions for the delivery of uh, notice in this agreement of purchase and sale or any schedule there too, not later than such and such a date if a new first mortgage satisfactory to the buyer in the buyer's sole and absolute and unfettered discretion cannot be arranged 
by the buyer at the buyer's expense. And then upon receipt of the notice, uh, this agreement shall be null and void and the deposit shall be returned to uh, the buyer in full without de deduction. Uh, if such notice is received within the appropriate time limit, et cetera, et cetera. So that's uh, important as a uh, as an alternative. Um, when it comes to good faith, and this is all contracts all the time, there is an obligation of good faith contractual performance in all contracts. Now, that's not good faith negotiating, all right? We're still waiting for that to come along, uh, where someone, you know, would have to negotiate in good faith. It doesn't quite go that far. What it says is, if we have a contract already negotiated, and it's in place, then there's a good faith obligation to, in terms of contractual performance. Uh, and that goes to the uh, Bassett and Renew case, which I think uh, everyone knows about, 13th of November, 2014. Um, and that was updated a little bit uh, by the Callow and Zollinger case in 2021. Uh, where they elevated uh, the concept and said, you know what, there's an obligation to speak up. Silence is not golden here. If you're supposed to say something, you better uh, get that information out there. And so that would be uh, uh, increase uh, the obligations uh, in terms of uh, uh, a party to a contract. And so that's something that we need to know about. Now, when we're looking over to the home inspection clause. This is it under the uh, under web forms. And it's a uh, standard provision which pops up all the time, and it's a good one. Uh, you know, continue to use that. Um, now, let's look at it in detail. This offer is conditional upon the inspection of the subject property. Okay, by a home inspector. Who? Who's a home inspector? I don't know. Are they registered? Are they licensed? I don't know, not in Ontario. Oh, they've been thinking about that for the last 15 years. But at this point in time, that's not the case. Uh, but as you know, there is a professional association, so you could specify that. And you do know that insurance is available to home inspectors. So you might want to have a couple of qualifications um, that it's a somebody who's a member of the professional association. You might want to specify that uh, they have insurance. There also could be a situation in uh, areas where uh, there are rogue home inspectors. Uh, there are fewer of them now simply because, you know, their reputations uh, precede them. And they will come into a property and say, oh, yes, I'll find, you know, like five, six, seven thousand dollars worth of work to be done. And then you can uh, negotiate that off the purchase price. No, 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 you don't want that person. So it could very well be that in a particular area, uh, if you're a seller, you might say, I'd like to be able to prove uh, the, you know, the home inspector. No, but I don't want that crazy guy coming here. Uh, anybody else is fine, but I don't want that uh, fellow coming in here. He's just going to monkey up my deal. So there's possibility. Uh, at the buyer's own expense, uh, and the obtaining of a report, okay? And what do we have in terms of the report? The report has to be satisfactory to the buyer in the buyer's sole and absolute discretion. Again, we're using that uh, same terminology. Uh, so looking through it, um, the unless this, the buyer gives notice in writing, delivered to the seller personally, or in accordance with any other uh, provisions for the delivery of notice, et cetera, et cetera. We saw that before. This offer shall be null and void, and the deposit shall be returned to the buyer in full without deduction. Seller agrees to cooperate in providing access to the property. So that's interesting. There can be any number of other situations in which you want to impose an obligation on the seller. It's sort of like, okay, this is going to be necessary for me to uh, have access. Um, so, um, you know, the person can't just walk around the outside and comment upon it. They've got to go through it and uh, recognize that. So uh, the, the further provisions are it's for the benefit of the buyer. It may be waived at the buyer's sole option by notice in writing uh, within the time period uh, stated. Now, 
what are we talking about in terms of absolute unfettered discretion? Well, uh, good faith applies to all clauses. Uh, prior to the Bassett and Renew case, uh, this was subjective. It's sort of like, okay, uh, John Smith, you put in the offer here uh, in your absolute unfettered discretion. Are you happy with uh, the home inspection report you just received? No, I'm not happy. Oh, well, that's not good. Uh, okay, well, they can walk away at a whim. But now it's sort of like, okay, John Smith, you have received this report. But the test now is we're not going to say, well, what would John Smith uh, want to do in these particular set of circumstances. No, what you can actually, uh, what the test is, what would a reasonable person in John Smith's position do in this set of circumstances? And so you have to know that it's objective now. So John Smith doesn't get to just bail uh, on uh, anything just because of his own whim. Now, is it possible to write a clause that does get around the Bassin and Renew case. Yes, you could. And what you could specify is um, when the, so you could specify that an subjective test applies, notwithstanding that this uh, contract amounts to nothing more than an option to purchase. Yeah, that's bringing it to their attention and they know that for sure. So if you did that, uh, you probably could creatively come up with uh, with a clause which dealt with that. But you have to know uh, a couple of things. What's the problem? Number one, I've got to cope with the Bassett and Renew decision. I've got to move this back to an subjective test. And just to clarify it and make sure that there's no misunderstanding, I'm going to aim at this and say this uh, deal is nothing more than an option to purchase on my part as the buyer. And that's fine. Person may agree to that. Now, when it comes to drafting, of course, the question is, where is this particular provision going to go? Is it going to go in the listing, the buyer representation agreement, an offer, a sign back, an amendment, a notice, a waiver? Um, or what else are you going to have? You could have an email. And the important document in your relationship with your client is not the actual uh, agreement of purchase and sale. Yeah, why? It went sideways. There was a problem with that. Yeah, you didn't word it properly there, but you gave the person the wrong impression um, of what the deal was. And where did you do that? In your email. That's where you need the good wording. That's where you need to have the most careful uh, explanations because that is the particular point where you might just be casual and not pay attention to something. And what are they going to hold up in court? They're going to hold up not the agreement of purchase and sale, where you could say, well, the wording in the agreement of purchase and sale is exactly what I had in mind. Yes, but you explained it differently to your own client in your email and what you were proposing to do. Oh, yeah. So the most important clause in the package uh, dealing with this particular client ends up being the email in terms of your own liability. So that's important. Pay attention to all those uh, situations. Issues. Uh, what are the issues that need to be addressed? Uh, now, number one, what is the law if nothing is done at all? Yeah, I'm not going to go in and um, you know, there's a rental contract here and they haven't put it in. So um, I should go sign it. I shouldn't draw anybody's attention to this fact. Um, I'm going to leave it out. And if I leave out and don't fill anything in at all, uh, then I'm good. What does that mean? It means that the seller is under a legal obligation to pay out the rental contract uh, and to leave the furnace uh, in place. Um, oh, perfect. That's exactly what I want. And what did you do there? Nothing. You put nothing in the agreement. You left it as it is. Um, and what happens if you do write it, something in that would say exactly what is in the agreement? Oh, then the seller uh, reads it and says, I didn't know that I had to pay that off. Yeah, well, you do. All right. So that in any event, it's something which you're better to know 
what would happen? What is the what are the provisions that apply if you don't say anything at all? So sometimes your extra wording is of no help whatsoever. So the question really is: Will this clause, by adding it, improve uh, your client's position? If it will, then that's good. Now, <clears throat> when you're going to draft the clause, you're going to address the issues. Uh, draft the clause for review. Uh, use that um, you know mortgage financing uh, checklist uh, as providing you with some deal of uh, of guidance in it. Um, deal with it in terms of where it's going to go. Condition, warranties, representations, terms. Uh, these are not mutually exclusive categories. Okay, you can put something in twice. And what I find is. A swimming pool. Uh, it's January, and you or it's May, and it just depends. You know, is it open? Is it closed? Is it working? What's the situation here? So you may want to put in. I would like to have a look at the swimming pool. Uh, I'm there's an extra hundred thousand dollars that you're asking for the uh, price of the house because of the swimming pool. So I'd like to see whether it's working. Num so you put that in say, okay, fine, it works, and so on. But the next thing is, you could still have a warranty. You could still have um, <clears throat> the ability to say, um, I want you to guarantee that this swimming pool uh, will be operational for 30 days uh, after I close the deal or, or whatever it happens to be. 30 days measured from the beginning, you know, the middle of May, that sort of thing, whatever it is that you need to uh, handle in terms of addressing it appropriately. But the mere fact that you've used it as a condition doesn't mean that you can't have the same thing again as a warranty. And so um, address these issues in this in this fashion. Um, done all the time when it comes to commercial contracts, rarely, rarely, uh, in terms of a real estate transaction. When it comes to uh, reviewing the clause, attempt to shorten it up a little bit. Uh, just don't type as much as you really need, but you know, you've got the long version in front of you. Uh, now, it's not necessary for you to say the parties agree that uh, because you've already got 15 pages of paperwork in front of you dealing with an, the agreement of purchase and sale. So. Surely, you don't need to say the parties agree that. So you can leave that out. Now, what if you did say it? No big deal. It's in there. It doesn't add anything. But, you know, if you had a very, very long clause, uh, maybe you could put in um, the parties agree to the following, point one, point two, point three, et cetera, et cetera. So eliminate any unnecessary words if you can. Uh, but that's not really, now we're talking about getting uh, scoring higher points in uh, you know English class. Uh, is this English class? No. If you got the right answer, you got the right answer, and it's already there. And your your version of fifty two words is just another way of me saying exactly the same thing, but only using twelve words. You say, well, yeah, that was good. Uh, and if you have somebody who's a real wordsmith, yeah, they could come up with twelve more likely that I'm kind of the person that's coming up with the 52 words. So, but it's still, it's still good. You can proceed with it. Now we're going to sit down and we're going to look at it from the opposing party's view. Read the clause again, carefully. Uh, this time from the perspective of the opposing par party's uh, view in the negotiations. Will the clause work? Number one, will it be struck? Okay, that's another thing. They're just going to strike it out. They're not going to amend it. They're going to just run a line through it. Now, it depends. How important is this clause? And could you craft it in a way that accomplished the same thing uh, without, uh, without anyone noticing? So let's say I wanted to get rid of caveat emptor. How do I get rid of caveat emptor? How about a one-liner? A little simple one-liner and get rid of caveat emptor. Now, I could say caveat emptor would, does not apply in this deal. Whoa, everybody's going to strike that out. 
no question about it. It's gone. It's gone. It doesn't exist. But all of a sudden, I write in, the fixtures and chattels will be in good working order on closing. Yeah, you just got rid of caveat emptor. Not good. Not good. If you're the seller, you say, I don't know how they'll work, or I'm not saying anything, or I'm just going to strike that out. Uh, but again, uh, just throwing it in, um, if you put in your eliminating caveat emptor, everyone will uh, will strike it out completely all the time. And if you put in good working order, fixtures and chattels, it seems normal. Um, now, uh, you want to reconsider your clause if it will not be incorporated into the agreement. Yeah, so why bother? Um, and when it comes to uh, the uh, listing agent's Schedule B, if you're in multiple offers, uh, it may very well be that if they have a number of clauses that are embarrassing to themselves, who cares? Let it embarrass them. Don't amend it. Just have it there. You're not raising any objections. You're not calling your uh, uh, own offer uh, out for further analysis and review. No, no. Uh, let's let's just leave it in and go with it. Uh, days in, compu in computation. Use a specific time for a deadline if it's possible. That adds clarity. You know, it's, you know, how about tomorrow at five o'clock? If you were arranging an appointment to do something and you wanted to go out to dinner with somebody, you might say, let's go out to, you know, tomorrow at five o'clock. Uh, well, the question would be, well, what you, when you say tomorrow, are you sure? Like, what do you mean Friday at five o'clock? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I do. Uh, you know, when, where, time, meeting location, et cetera. That's what you've got to know. So be specific when it comes to time periods. If you're negotiating over a period of five days, that is, you know, the working week, uh, then you're likely to require uh, more time. So add them in, add them in, whatever that happens to be. If you use calendar days, you're fine. Just count them up. And how many days do you need? Do you need three days for, uh, for um, you know, to get to the bank? Or, uh, you know, do you need four days? Well, you know, it's all different if you're looking at facing, if you're on a Friday going into a Saturday and Sunday, you're going to need more time. You need to be there on Monday. And so make sure that you add, throw in the right number of days calendar days, because they're clear uh, going forward. Now, when you're counting, uh, make sure you know how to count. Uh, now, just as a matter of fact, uh, this goes back to uh, grade uh, one and grade two. Um, and that is you start at zero. Zero is the first number. One is not the first number. Zero is the first number. So the day of the agreement is day zero. The next day is day one. The day after that is day two. All right. Now, what do we have? The day after the <laughs> that third day out, many people count, count, uh, count that as uh, day three. No, it's not day three. So make sure that uh, you're counting correctly. Also, make sure that the other side is counting correctly. Now, <clears throat> avoid business days and avoid banking days. They're vague and uncertain terms if you if they are used and that is you've seen them in the uh, in some sort of reference uh make sure that there's a specific definition in the agreement uh either contained in schedule a because you know that uh, there's references in schedule b already or you would prefer to use uh one of those uh, terms throw in the definition in schedule a then it's clear no problem now it's important to be aware of the fact that business days under uh, REBA uh, means any day other than a Saturday. So a Sunday is a business day. Be aware of that under the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act regulations. So um, if you're thinking that business days is Monday to Friday uh, under REBA, you would be incorrect in that uh, uh, context. Uh, now, when it comes to banking days, there's no definition under the Bank Act. 
what we would like is, well, surely, you know, for all these big banks, um, but they're in business 24 seven, 365 days a year. They're operational. There's people on the night shift, et cetera, et cetera. So banking days, then you're going to have to come up with a very peculiar definition, which is going to um, uh, deal with what a banking day is in court explaining what it is oh well the uh, you know the doors are open but well can you get into the atm yeah i can get into the atm but i you know the tellers i can't get in because there's a you know the uh a roll of uh uh doorways that are uh, brought out in front and i can't get in past uh, them no no just just don't do that that doesn't make any sense so if you use them define them use calendar days for whatever strange reason, I haven't run into a person yet who doesn't know what a calendar day is. So that would be fairly clear. Time. How much time is needed? Be specific. When does it end? Well, each day ends at uh, 23, 59 and 59 uh, seconds. Um, so you don't want to be dealing with your client at that point in time. They're probably sleepy. All right. And so after 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock is my deadline. If we're not, if we don't have a deal by 10 o'clock, let's start again in the morning. Uh, I have no intention of uh, negotiating uh, from 10 o'clock uh, to midnight, past midnight. And you know what the interesting thing is? There's a significant number of errors that are made at one and two o'clock in the morning. People just miss stuff. Oh yeah, they get the wrong price. Well, they don't, they have the right and the wrong price on the deal. Um, 925000 in writing and 952000 in numbers on the front page. Oh, everybody missed it. Oh, and everybody put their own 12 initials over everything. So if they agree to this, if they not agree to it, you've got a mess. So one of the things, you know, if you're not alert, uh, or, you, or your client is not alert, all right? Uh, don't be uh, trying to do things uh, when they're uh, not, uh, uh, not completely alert uh, in terms of dealing with things. What's the end of the time period? Not later than. That's good wording. Saw that in the uh, uh, mortgage financing provision, all right? So what that says, so if you said not later than 8 p.m., that that would mean 8.01 is too late irrevocable until eight, all right? So it's until, that may not necessarily include eight itself, um, that are you looking at uh, 7.59 and 59? Hey, possible argument. Within five days. Now, how many days is that? Does that mean four days, not later than four days? Or are we looking at uh, four or possibly five days? So you've got, if you use the first expression, not later than, that'd be perfect. Uh, within 24 hours, uh, deposit delivery. Well, that's interesting. So if you had eight o'clock is the contract amount, 7.59 and 59 seconds uh, the next day would be the uh, time that it's actually due. Prior to 31st of uh, July, actually, you run the risk of that meaning the 30th. Prior to the expiration of the 30th, uh, 31 July. Yeah, that would be 31st of July. On or before 31st of July. Yeah, 31st of July is definitely included. And what do you have in many different situations? People grab precedents and templates from all over the place and they don't read them. And so in one deal, we'll have not later than, we'll have within, and we'll have prior to all being and prior to the expiration uh, all being in one deal and you say oh, i thought these were all due at the same time no they're not they're you've got a mess here we're not sure we, we've got vagueness now what happens in that situation well if one of the parties wishes to depart from the deal there's their argument if they're anxious to complete the deal they're going ahead anyways you really don't even need good paperwork 
Offer and acceptance. Remember, that's a two-step process. Execution or signing of the document. That's step one. Step two is communicating. You got to tell the other party that you've got a deal. Yeah, I've signed it. Uh, you know, the the deal is firm. Uh, and without <clears throat> step two, we don't have an actual acceptance. So the confirmation of acceptance that you see in many agreements of uh, purchase and sale, that might be uh, incorrect. Uh, there's two steps, not one. But once we have that, what we're looking for is that's the evidence for the commencement of all the time periods. Um, my comment would be very frequently, uh, what we have is uh, a person will sign the agreement and then they will immediately move down to the confirmation of acceptance without any communication having been made. Ah, that's not, that's incorrect. We have an incorrect time. That might be helpful for you to know in the transaction going forward. Uh, managing the contract, note all the time periods, do not have the agreement become null and void by mistake. This can be fatal uh, and you can't revive the agreement. You can revive the agreement, the deal, using all of the old paperwork if you want. But you, what you end up with is a new uh, agreement in place. In terms of risk management, document each step so that you know what you're doing here. Uh, email is an excellent resource to communicate accurately and record precisely your intentions, your advice, and the steps in the process. Retain copies for the file, transfer copies to a hard drive, simply, or internet servers, whatever you want to do, have that. And really, realistically, there's no actual time limitation. Uh, you could have someone uh, purchase a property, not discover uh, an issue for 10 years. And then all of a sudden they discover an issue and they're suing your client and they're suing you. And they've got two years to do, do it after that. That takes them out to year 12. Uh, it, they've got another year to uh, serve you with the documents. That's year 13. It's sort of like, oh, geez, didn't know that. So store it all. Um, electronically, simple uh, situation. Now, the other thing is consider stack conditions. The mere fact that you have every uh, condition um, and it comes with its own walkaway paragraph. Okay, then it's a walkaway, then it's a walkaway. Okay, so we go through that, which means that you're gonna have pages and pages uh, if you have a variety of different uh, conditions. So what are you going to do? Write them all into one clause and simply say, you know what, rather than going through all these individual items, um, let's just note this up. The longest condition is, um, you know, uh, we'll say is uh, 10 days. So we won't know until then. But have everything. You don't have to deal with mortgage financing in three days and then et cetera, et cetera. No, no, throw it all out. Uh, 10 days, leave it at that, have a series of stack conditions, it looks fine, and you're not running back and forth, uh, and you're able to manage the transaction uh, much easier, and it uh, it's good from that perspective. So, thank you. I think we're just within our time period. Yep, perfect. Well, perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you for everything. And I know we went slightly over, so there's not that much time for questions. But as everyone will know, Brian is available. Um, he's frequently available. He loves speaking about this stuff. And he's a genuine resource to all of us, as you can see. I strongly suggest, Brian, you just take one second and just announce when your next classes are. Because if you like this, you can get a lot of it as Brian goes through things. So, Brian, I'm just going to give you one more second before we all kind of sign off. If you want to just let people know when that's taking place, it is for everyone's benefit that you attend these classes. Now, uh, let me just, so uh, yes, so I have uh, a program starting um, and it's six days, total of uh, 18 hours, three hours per day. Uh, so it's running, not, uh, not this week, um, starts on the, Gosh, the following 
following week, last two weeks in May and the first uh, week in uh, June. So Tuesday and Wednesday, Tuesday and Wednesday the next week, Tuesday and Wednesday the week after that. And uh, it's just in the morning. So 9.30 to uh, 12.30 and then we're done. Uh, what that does is avoids uh, realtor quest. It also avoids uh, the RICO AGM and it also um, provides you with uh, the long weekend. <laughs> so that's the reason. Usually we do it uh, just over two weeks, but uh, here this is fine and this uh, may work out to some in fit with somebody's schedule. The other thing is if someone enrolls, you're enrolled for a year. Pop back, come in, take take it, retake it anytime you want. One uh, year. Great. Thank you, Brian. And Brian, on behalf of all of us, sincere thank you. Uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. It shows. And we are very appreciative of you having spent time with us today. Guys, look for our next one coming up shortly. And hopefully I'll see everyone at Realtor Quest as well. I'll be there manning a legal review booth. So I'll see you there for legal review. Take care, guys. Okay.